Discover your adventure today at WNNU.edu.
Good evening. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming out to our very first last lecture series. Um, we're really excited about this new initiative that Student Life is partnering up with um, faculty to facilitate, uh, facilitate, and we're looking to host another last lecture in October. So we'll be sending out votes for the students to vote on the faculty member that they would like to hear a last lecture from in September, so be looking for those. I am very excited tonight to bring up an individual that has been influential in my life and I am sure in the lives of many others. And I know that tonight is going to be a special treat. We have dinner on the pool patio following um, the lecture, so if you can, stick around. So at this time, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Manzanares. I was not supposed to be here. And let me explain why. The way that I used to explain it to my students for 17 years, those students who, for those 17 years, I taught the same class, but over 50 times. And then the other students, 18 years before, when I used to teach a whole variety of classes from second graders in after school programs to junior and senior high school students, uh, they all were migrant uh, workers, the junior high and the high school. And then I taught community college, I taught graduate students. And I tried to explain to them through the subject matter that I was teaching, the ideas or the, or the concepts of persistence, honesty, and trust. And I used to tell them that in the case of American national government, we start with the ideas of human nature, or what we call the human beings in the state of nature. The state of nature is nothing else but when men, as they used to say, found themselves without rules and regulations, therefore, in the state of nature. In that state of nature's, nature, human beings were justified in killing each other because they were defending their own basic human God-given rights. We conceptualize in our society those God-given rights as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So, in the state of nature, we find ourselves with the right, with justification, to take somebody else's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness because there are, there are no rules or regulations. Thus, what comes after that is the creation of civil society. That is, when a group of people come together to defend those three God-given rights through something that is called government. That government, certainly in a democratic system, is the government that we trust. We place our trust in that government. And that is a very abstract concept, government. It is not the president, it is not Congress, it is not the governor. It is an abstract concept that we trust and now we believe in. At least that's what we are led to believe. And so that government that we created, certainly we evolved from the state of nature 
many, 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 many centuries from, to 1789, when the U.S. Constitution was adopted, in September, by the way. And so, in that Constitution, we tried to create then a government. We created the government that we have, whose sole purpose, that's all our government is supposed to do, to protect those three natural rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How does the government then attempt to protect those natural rights? Well, one is by creating public policy. Public policy is nothing but, you know, the things that we get from government, quote-unquote. Education, health, safety, so on and so forth. But in order to arrive at that, to create those public policies, we have to have a political system that allows for the citizens in a democracy to participate in the making of public policy through that government. And so, but in order for us to do that, we have to enjoy a certain degree, or a high degree, I hope, of freedom, which we call together civil liberties and civil rights, that protects us from the government and protects us from other people in the exercise of our freedoms, of our God-given rights. And so, through the process of political participation, of civic participation, we try to influence, to impact government, so it can create those policies that will benefit us as a society as, and also as individuals. Yes, it's boring, you know, political science, politics. I don't want to be involved in politics. But yet, here we are in a public institution created through public policy. So each one of us have the opportunity to acquire a certain degree of education. And if you are interested in politics, that's fine. But only be cognizant that you are a byproduct as a citizen of a political process that affords us the opportunity to obtain education, like in this case. So we trust the government to a certain degree. We trust that the government will protect those rights. And we, 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 when we don't see that happening, then most of us you know, get involved in civic and political activities to impact that government. I was not supposed to be here. I was born with a deficit. What I, do I mean by that? My parents never learned to read and write. My grandparents didn't even know what school was. I was born in a little place where the only light was the sun and the moon. And when there was no moon, it was darker than me. So how do you travel through that, from that to today where I am? Through persistence, through trusting people, and to thanking people that come along the way that help you uh, to get to where you want to go. It was 40 years ago that I started teaching. And it was four years ago, actually, this year that I stopped teaching. But that journey began in August 20th of 1975. It was the first time that I 
climbed into an airplane. In fact, it was the first time that I had seen an airplane on the ground. And I was told, you are going to land in this town, city called San Francisco. And a man is going to pick you up. And that man will drive 55 miles. Mind you, I was thinking about kilometers at the time. And he will take you and you will live with his family. I knew, I think, between 15 and 20 words of English. Couldn't pronounce them. And I arrived in San Francisco at around 9 p.m. It was getting dark already by then. And there was Louis Guglielmino, an Italian-American fellow who learned Later on, I learned he had written a master thesis on Pancho Villa. I didn't know that. And he talks to me in Italian. And, you know, like, you know, a little bit, a couple of words I understood. I say, okay, well, let's go. I get there. A week later, I was going to go to high school. I didn't know. I go to high school. They take me to high school 15 miles away. And here are you have priests in one school for guys. On the other side, there were nuns, a high school for girls. I didn't know what was going on, really. But I thought that that was good. I thought. There was a reason why I was coming to the U.S. in 1975. All I wanted to do is to get out of the hot sun where my grandpa used to plant his little chiles and maize and ajonjoli, sesame seed. Because it was hot. I didn't like that very well. All I wanted to do was to learn a few phrases in English so I could go back and move to the city to work in a hotel or a restaurant where I can communicate a little bit with tourists and be in the shade. I didn't think about salaries. I didn't think about benefits. I only thought about the opportunity to work in the shade. That was the extent of my goal. Things happen for a reason, I suppose. You are hungry. Hungry of, for knowledge. Hungry to discover the world. Hungry to do something for yourself and your family. A friend of mine out of Oklahoma I thought she was an old lady. She was probably 35. That's an old lady anyway, so I thought. Mrs. Ellie Lefleur. Say, stay put, Magdaleno. Finish high school. Oh, by the way, when I came in 1975, I only had finished eighth grade. Because I was 17 at the time when I finished seventh grade. I was put in the 11th grade. 17 because there were only, in those days, only a few grades in the school. And so that was the end of the road. So anyways, I, 11th grade, what did I know? Miss Lefleur told me, stay put. Finish high school so you can help your family. Father Finn, Father Wisick, Father Delaney, they all told me, stick around. You should finish high school. We'll take, of, take care of everything. 
tuition, bus rides, everything. It was a prep school. It is a prep school in Northern California. At the end, I ended up taking physics, chemistry, math. I don't know how I passed, but I passed. And in my senior year, Jack, I began to take European literature. And I was caught by the literature. And I began to read and read and read, both in Spanish and in English, a tradition that persists to this day. I was captured by the reality of other people as described by literature, by poetry. No, I didn't major in English. English is only a tool or was a tool for me to get where I wanted to go. I finished high school and the Guglielminos told me, go to the community college, get a degree so you can be in better shape to help your family. And it didn't take that much of convincing. What I'm trying to tell you is you take the opportunity when it arrives. Yes, you might be scared. We are scared. We always scare one way or another. You seize the opportunity and you go forward. It's not an easy road, but we have to learn to take risks and to trust that the people that are advising you will be doing it because they want the best for you. So I did that. I finished the community college. By the time I finished community college, I was an operations manager for a radio station. I was a teacher, I thought, because I was teaching radio production. How, how to put together a script and put it into a radio soap, if you will, soap opera. Learn the things of, in those days, analog stuff. Splicing tapes, checking mics, making sure people had the right stuff, the right voice. Listen, in radio, you are afford to be ugly like me because nobody is seeing you, they only hear you. And so that's what we did. I, in my sophomore year, my last year in community college, I took this boring class that was called political philosophy, taught by this tough looking guy who was always in shorts and t-shirts because he used to play Brumke. But I was enthralled by his discussions about Socrates, about Rousseau, J.S. Mill, etc. And he asked me, as we were walking down from the second floor where I was taking the class, he said, Magdaleno, what are you planning to do? I said, I want to be like you. You are white, you are tough looking, good looking, I'm short, bald legged, dark, but I want to be like you. He laughed. And they say, you can do it. I say, okay. What do I need to do to be like you in the sense of being a teacher? He said, well, if you want to be in a community college, at least in those days, you have to have a master's degree. But if you want to teach in the other college, this nearby, four-year college, you need a PhD. I said, okay. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. Nonetheless... In that moment of inspiration, I decided to study international relations. And I said, well, it makes sense. I should go out of the country to study international relations. So I said, well, yeah, I'm familiar with Mexico somehow. So I transferred down to a place in Mexico that I had never been there, had no idea what it was. I was accepted, I landed, and all the Mexicans that I met there were not my Mexicans. You know, the children of governors, the children of former presidents, and all that, Europeans, Americans, they all congregated in that university at the time. I was out of my element for the second time in my life. You know, I came from the land of the burro, literally, because that's what we had, burros, in my hometown to the airplane, to the shocking experience in Sonoma County in Northern California. 
to going back to the Mexico that I thought I knew, but hell, that was not it. So, long story short, yes. Two years, I got the BA in international relations. Time to go back. And I was not supposed to do all those things. But there was a mother that I still have. I had a father who learned how to write a little bit his name on his own. And I had a maternal grandfather who instilled in me the desire not to be like him in terms of what he was doing for a living, to work every single day in the fields. Inspired me without him knowing what. But he used to tell me, school is good. He couldn't tell me exactly what. Or the blind professor that I had when I was doing my PhD who told me, if you can explain this to your grandmother and she understand it, you don't deserve the PhD. Humility. The more, he said, the more education you have, the more humane and humble you should be. I took it to heart. My mom, my dad, but mostly my grandfather. And that professor. So there were people, the Guglielminos, the Mazas later on. I don't know, I like Italians. Um, and uh, they adopted me in that sense. So, no, I'm not... I'm not, I was not supposed to be here. And then, years passed. I applied to only one job. It was this one. I was doing radio. I was doing other things. And in 1993, I happened to be driving from Flagstaff to El Paso. And I came across this town around noon. It was raining. It was also August. I stopped at the Chinese restaurant that people who don't really go searching for it will not find it. Across Domino's, I had the most excellent Chinese food there. I looked around and I saw buildings over here and it was raining. I said, oh, I wonder what is that? Went off. Several years later, I was reading the newspaper, Chronicle of Higher Education. I was living in Oregon at the time. And I told my wife at the time, I said, hey, there's a university in that little town we went through. She said, well, apply. I think she wanted to get rid of me. I, so I applied. I got it. I came. I never thought, you know, I flew into the airport. I looked down. I said, Jesus Christ. I'll get my free lunch at the Golden Corral at the time. Remember? <laughs> and I will just head back. I was treated very nicely in the application process, um, rather the interview process. And I told Elvia at the time, I said, you know, even if I don't get a job, I'm very happy people treat me well, et cetera. So I ended up here. One year went by, second year went by, and then I realized that this is the place where I wanted to be. At the beginning, some students questioned my credentials. How come are you teaching constitutional development? How come you're teaching American national government? Aren't you Mexican? I say yes. So then there was that one who in the final exam, they only used blue books in those days, wrote the big essay. And at the end, she wrote, I thought you were discriminating against me because I'm blind, because you always ask me questions. But now I realize what you were trying to do. 
I thank you very much. Or the other student who said, you know, what do they know? She wrote in the final exam later, later on, in a different class, in those 17 years. She said, why are you here? You could be anywhere you want to. Why are you wasting your time here? I never had to, obviously. That was the end of that. She graduated. Or the other one who went to a private university to do a PhD in education. And he said, oh, my goodness, this is quite different than Western. I said, yes, very different, isn't it? He said, and I'm glad I went to Western because I also came with a deficit in skills, opportunities from high school where he came from. And he graduated, and at least in history and political science, he was like just anybody else at that university. He finished his PhD, he has a great job in California, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the experiences that I had as a person, as individual, as a son, as a grandson, as a teacher. I never called myself a professor, never, ever. I always would like to claim that I am a teacher. But it's a difficult concept to grasp. It's a very diffi difficult role to play as a teacher. You have to be humble. They ask me when I used to go around out of here, what do you do? I teach immediately. What grade? Well, you know, depending on what semester they are. Oh, you must be teaching Spanish. No, you know, I teach political science, whatever the hell is that. So I, I, I learned from early on that you have to be humble, that you have to be able to communicate in whatever language, fashion, mode, with people so they understand who you are and you understand who they are. I like to think that I am like my grandpa, but people tell me when I go to my hometown that I don't speak the same way. Or that, you know, I obviously we are all impacted by our own environment and my environment is this. And so I'm impacted by that. So, aside from the purely academic, intellectual challenges that we get as we go through life or to, through education, there is that other side that we should never lo lose sight of. And that is to be a human being. And remember, the more educated you are, the more humane you become. If you really do that. If you get a degree and you don't get an education, you wasted your time because you don't become a better human being necessarily. So I believe in education because that's what brought me here. I believe in the people that trusted me and keep on trusting me or what I do, for what I do. But I don't think... In the process of learning, and this is kind of a sidebar, but certainly since we are in education, and you guys and gals are part of the elite, because not everybody can or is here or anywhere else similar to this to get higher education. You are part of the elite. But one thing that is relevant to me, at least in my 40 years of teaching, is that no matter what class you must be taking, whether it's chemistry, whether it's literature, whether it's art, there is no subject that is boring. The action, really, of learning is so exciting. If you don't get excited, 
as much as when you are making love, you are missing the boat. You may get bored because maybe the professor, the teacher is boring and you are not paying attention because you jump. You know, how many of you have followed me all these minutes? Uh, not all of you. Some of you have taken trips in your mind somewhere and come back and catch me saying this and that and the other. Learning is the most exciting thing that could happen, I think, to a human being. And it lasts a lot, a lot longer than an orgasm. Believe me. I only read that other part, but this other part about learning is true. I remember reading at 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, Hamilton, Madison, Rousseau. I said, oh, my goodness, I woke up and, you know, all these things. So exciting that I think we should be able then to appreciate that. So if it is chemistry or physics, it's exciting. And that was my challenge, my persistence. I never dropped a class. I almost plunked them, but I never dropped a class. Because my way of thinking was, early on I learned it from my professors, my teachers, that there is nothing boring about physics or literature or political science or whatever it is is as boring as you can make it for yourself. So, how do I do my own public policy as an individual? Government does it because it creates laws and regulations that, uh, uh, you know, the whole idea is to enhance education, health, uh, safety, foreign relations, interdomestic uh, politics, etc. How do I do it in my life? how I make my own public policy, how do I capture all this abstract knowledge, all this learning, all these things that I got from books and friends and colleagues, how do I make it a reality for me and for my family and my community? I get involved. I was a volunteer in 11th grade. I was a volunteer in 12th grade. I have been a volunteer all that time, at least 40 years, and I'm still a volunteer. Involved in political, civic activities, involved in health organizations, involved in economic development organizations, involved in trying to help those people who need help, or at least I think, through those organizations. And in November, I will co-author my third book. I still do that. Because, hey, why not? I don't have it. I have enough time to do that. Oh, yes, I'm married. I have a wife. I have friends. Yeah, I drink once in a while. Not that often. Or almost every other day, water. <laughs> but anyways, to conclude... I hope that you can mesh your own life story, your own life experience with what you are doing in college and beyond. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Do you have any comments, questions, rotten tomatoes, spoiled eggs, you know, feel free. Otherwise, I'm going that way. Thank you guys for everything, for showing up. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manzanadis, for providing your last lecture for us. Again, dinner is on the patio, so if you can stay, sit with us, and have some dinner. Thank you. <laughs>